Hello, and welcome to the Computing Conversations column. This column is from the December 2012 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled Vint Cerf, A Brief History of Packets. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, academics, governments, and companies around the world built and deployed our current shared intranet infrastructure using the TCP IP protocol. Having a well-developed open protocol implemented on a wide range of computers was an essential prerequisite for the internet's rapid success and growth. The simple answer to the question, where did TCP IP come from, is that its basis was ARPANET, an earlier small-scale research network. I recently spoke about this technology's emergence with Vint Cerf, who is recognized as one of the fathers of the Internet and was a co-founder of the Internet Society, which was established in 1992 to provide leadership in establishing Internet-related standards, education, and policy. Of course, the real answer to the question of TCP IP origins is that ultimately it emerged from 20 years of research into a wide array of topics that explored moving from a telephone-style circuit-switched infrastructure that required dedicated resources for every active pair of users to a packet-switched infrastructure where all active users dynamically shared all the resources. Packet switching was an idea which was specifically studied by Len Kleinrock at MIT who was actually looking at message switching and he did a brilliant uh, dissertation on the use of queuing theory to analyze what networks of queues would look like using this message switching approach. And his analysis, although we'd never used the word packet, uh, is as equally applicable to packet switching as it is to message switching. So that's one important milestone in around 1961. One advantage of a packet switch network is that it can dynamically route data around partial network outages as might be experienced during wartime or perhaps due to severe large-scale weather events such as hurricane or typhoon. While working at RAND in 1962, Paul Barron created an extensive design for a resilient packet switch voice network, as SURF describes it. So Paul, in 1962, before the existence of uh, integrated circuits or anything else, uh, is saying we really should be digitizing and packetizing voice and then using sort of uh, pole-mounted radios that are able to transmit in all directions to create a highly connected environment so that if holes were knocked out of it by nuclear explosions, you would still, if it's a fabric that's in any way connected, information could get from one end to the other. So he envisioned the notion of a message block, and it was dynamically routed. He used hot potato routing. If you got something, you got rid of it as fast as you could. He chopped up the speech into little 20 millisecond pieces. He didn't talk so much about data as I remember it. And this was supposed to be a highly resilient voice network for command and control. I may have just done him a disservice because later uh, he was very much uh, conscious of the importance of data communication, too. So that's around 1962. It gets documented in in an 11-volume series called On Distributed Communications, and he can't sell it to anybody. The uh, traditional telcos, AT&T in particular, and the people at what was then the Defense Communication System, or Defense Communications Agency, laughed him out of the room, said this was a silly idea, it couldn't possibly work, and so, you know, he should just go away. So he never got anywhere with that, in spite of all the documentation. But academics were starting to do research on how to break data into packets and send those packets over the traditional telephone network or local area wired networks. Then in the 64 or 65 time frame, uh, a man named Donald W. Davies of the National Physical Laboratory in London also gets the bug, tries to get money from the uh, Science Research uh, Commission at, uh, at, in uh, England and gets only enough to build one node, you know, the one node network. So he builds this packet net. He invents the term packet to describe what these objects are, and it works. He's got a bunch of, you know, terminals and other things hanging off of this one node. So in a a funny way, he built a local area network, if you like. Uh, But it was, you know, based on physical wires. In 66, Larry Roberts, along with one other guy whose name I'm now not remembering, does a point-to-point experiment to test packet switching. It was between the 
uh, ANSFQ7 machine at, S at System Development Corporation in Santa Monica and uh, the uh, TX2 machine at MIT, at Lincoln Laboratories, which is where Larry was. They demonstrated on a 2400 you know, bit line, bit per second line, that you could move packets back and forth. While the research into the theoretical and technical aspects of packet switching was underway, another thread of inquiry explored what people might do with such a ubiquitous always-on network. J.C.R. Licklider is a, a psychologist, actually, at MIT, but he's convinced in the early 60s that computing is important to non-numeric processing, that it will allow people to work together and collaborate in ways that they never could before. He comes and starts the information processing techniques office at ARPA with this B in his bonnet. And who does he encounter? He encounters Douglas Engelbart at SRI International, and the two bond, basically, because Engelbart was all about non-numeric computing and the ability of people to build up uh, the superstructure of communications and documents and interact with each other, hyperlinking, the mouse, the portrait mode display, back on white, black on white presentations. I mean, the, the guy had a World Wide Web in a box at SRI, and uh, Licklider understands that. Licklider sending out notes to his little community of, of people talking about the intergalactic network. I mean, he's tongue in cheek. Uh, so he really gets credit for having put this meme in place at ARPA. In addition to the growing notions of how people could collaborate via a shared digital network, there was also the practical consideration of deploying increasing numbers of computers and computer terminals to meet the military's information processing needs. Then Taylor comes along to pick up the, the responsibility for running the IPTO from Licklider and is all hacked off because he's got three terminals in his office at the Pentagon connected to three different machines and he can't. He says, why can't there be one terminal talking to all three? We need a network. And so uh, as he's pursuing this idea uh, with uh, Charlie Hertzfeld, who's the head of ARPA at the time, Charlie hands him a million bucks over a 20-minute conversation and now Taylor's got the problem, who's going to actually do this? Because Taylor's not a technologist either. He's another, you know, kind of psychologist type. So he decides to get Larry Roberts from Lincoln Laboratories. With one million to spend on research into shared packet switch network infrastructure, the IPTO wrote a request for quotation to solicit research proposals. Cerf wrote one of many responses to the ARPA RFQ for network research. A bunch of responses come back, probably on the order of a couple dozen. I don't know personally for sure how many. I know that I wrote one of them with my colleague Bob, or, uh, Steve Crocker while we were still at UCLA as graduate students, but we were consulting with a company called Jacoby Systems in S Santa Monica. Jacoby Systems wrote one of the responses. Bolt Baranek and Newman wrote another response, primarily written by Bob Kahn, who came to BBNN from MIT. So um, the responses come back and they get evaluated and four of them end up and the Jacoby Systems one isn't one of them or if it was it didn't get selected, BBNN got selected. So Steve Crocker and I kind of hiked back to UCLA as graduate students uh, and the next thing we know, Len Kleinrock who's at UCLA and who'd written you know, this original dissertation work on packet switching has come to UCLA to, to teach and explore um, a queuing theory is uh, a close uh, compatriot of Larry Roberts, because they were both at Lincoln Labs together. So he gets the Network Measurement Center piece of the ARPANET project. Surf, Crocker, and John Postel, all UCLA graduate students who had attended the same high school in this California San Fernando Valley, were recruited to join Kleinrock's lab to help design and build the technology that would be used in the ARPANET. So I was the principal programmer for that. Steve Crocker took the responsibility for managing and leading the network working group that led to the protocols, host-to-host -host protocols. And John Postel eventually becomes the keeper of the documentation. He's the RFC editor, which Steve Crocker started, request for comments. He's the guy that becomes the numbers czar, which is keeping track of address spaces and allocations, and eventually becomes the domain name manager or the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority when the Internet happens. And that hasn't happened yet. ARPANET eventually evolved to the point that, in 1972, it worked well enough for a demonstration. The first demonstration of the ARPANET happens uh, in the uh, Washington Hilton Hotel basement in October of 72. A whole bunch of people from the networking, interested networking community, packet switching community, attend, not only in the U.S., but from France and from England and Italy and Germany and elsewhere. 
Uh, that group of about 25 or 30 people uh, convenes, sees the ARPANET in operation, sees applications that were being done, uh, including Doug Engelbart's stuff, and then forms this international network working group modeled after the working group that Steve Crocker managed to build the ARPANET system. And at this point, I become the chairman of that group because Steve is busy at ARPA doing artificial intelligence. At the end of 1972, Cerf graduated from UCLA and became a faculty member at Stanford. Bob Kahn moved from BBNN to ARPA and took the ARPANET project to the next level. And in the spring of 73, Bob comes out from uh, ARPA and he says, I have a problem. He says, what's your problem? He says, well, we got this ARPANET. I said, yep. But we also are working on other networking capability to make command and control work for the military. If you're going to be serious about putting computers in command and control, they have to be mobile. They have to be in you know, armored personnel vehicles and tanks and all these other things. They have to be seaborne so we can have ship-to-ship -ship and ship-to-shore communications, which means satellite. And we, uh, so we need mobile radio, we need satellite, in addition to the fixed wire systems that are uh, represented by the ARPANET. We have fixed installations that are not moving around. So you have all these different technologies, and Bob's brilliant idea is not to build one network with all those technologies embedded in it. Instead, he breaks them apart and says, let's build a packet satellite network, which optimizes the use of satellite, takes into account that it's got a half a second round trip time. Let's build a packet radio network, which optimizes a system whose connectivity is changing with time as things move around and as you get variable delay and uh, also variable interference. Expanding from the original telephone line-based ARPANET to a network architecture that included many cooperating networks with points of interconnection required a new design. So we design and build a gateway, which today we call a router, and that concept also introduced a whole bunch of other things like how do you refer to another network? Each network thinks it's the only network in the universe. This is true of the proprietary networks like SNA and DECnet and so on. And uh, you didn't have a vocabulary that said, take this packet and move it to another computer on another network somewhere else that you might not even be connected to. So we have to invent an Internet address space in order to solve that problem. We have to find a way to allow packet losses in this path to be recovered, which is where TCP now becomes a manager of reliability on an end-to-end -end basis instead of relying on each net to be reliable. The ARPANET was built on the assumption you could build a reliable underlying net. The Internet was based on the assumption that no network was necessarily reliable and you had to do end-to-end -end retransmissions to recover. This work on a network of networks began in earnest as a research project funded by ARPA. Cerf and his colleagues did all their design work in the open and shared it with academic and commercial communities. Bob and I get the papers, first paper written and published in IEEE Transactions on Communications. May of 1974. And I think mostly nobody paid too much attention to it. Meanwhile, ARPA is funding us to go make this actually work. At Stanford, I am working with my graduate students, some who are at Xerox Park, some are uh, at uh, Stanford, on the detailed specifications of TCP IP. We published that in December of 1974, and it's the first time the word Internet shows up in print anywhere. From 1973 to 1978, the research team designed and implemented four complete iterations of the Internet protocols as they found and solved new challenges. One innovation was to separate the TCP layer into TCP and IP, which let real-time applications use the Internet without the error correction added by TCP. For the next five years, we, start, we do everything we can to get TCP IP implemented on every operating system we can find. It goes on to the IBM machines, it goes on to the de digital machines, HP, it goes into Unix. We have a Unix version built by Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. We send it out to Berkeley, to the Berkeley BSD release guys, and Bill Joyce says, I don't like that code, and he writes his own, puts it into BSD 4.2, and that's the version of uh, Unix that carries a lot of TCP IP to the academic world because at the same sort of time frame, some microsystems comes along and builds these fantastic workstations and they want to use open source uh, or at least open protocols uh, and uh, open operating systems. So they adopt Unix and the TCP IP comes with it and they use Ethernet as a way of connecting the workstations together. So they are the engine 
that's driving the academic community, which are all gangbusters for workstations and high-speed local networking. As the number of workstations and mainframe computers that could support TCP IP and be connected to ARPANET grew, an increasingly rich set of network applications were developed. More universities and research labs wanted to be connected to ARPANET, and its infrastructure started to grow under the network traffic load. So all of this, of course, places huge demands on the ARPANET uh, backbone, which is only running at 50 kilobits a second, and eventually leads to the need for higher speed. NSF jumps into the fray, seeing how valuable all this is for the academic community, and concludes that it should build a network that runs even faster, and it does so, and it's called NSFNet. What's amazing about the story of the ARPANET is that from its earliest days, it focused on connecting people, information, and technology. It's also a story of having patience and being willing to take the time to build it right technically, even if doing it right means starting over from time to time. A relatively small group of well-funded researchers working closely together for more than 20 years, starting over and redesigning their systems multiple times as new use cases presented themselves. It's fortunate that by the mid-1980s, TCP IP was a well-developed technology that provided a solid basis for the Internet revolution of the 80s and the web revolution of the 1990s. This column is from the December 2012 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled Vint Cerf, A Brief History of Packets. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan.